Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru, and there's no denying that the PC gaming landscape has changed significantly in the last 10 years, and while this is a sponsored video, there's also no denying that Nvidia has been at the forefront of that since its first RTX GPUs landed in 2018. One thing we have come to learn in that time is that getting a great gaming experience isn't just about raw power anymore. Instead, it comes down to what Nvidia calls the three pillars of gaming, that being latency, frame rate, and image quality. Today then, we're on a mission to help explain some of the key features that have launched over the last few years and how they tie back to those three pillars. Because with so many buzzwords and new technologies flying around, things like DLSS, super resolution, frame generation, reflex, and more, it can be easy to lose track of what actually matters and why. We'll be doing this thanks to some of the latest and greatest from Nvidia's RTX 50 series GPUs, and we'll also be using some recent and highly popular games, including Doom the Dark Ages, F125, Marvel Rivals, and more, so stay tuned as we go over everything you need to know. Up first then, we're going to be looking at DLSS Super Resolution, which first debuted with the Turing 20 series back in 2018, but was overhauled with the launch of DLSS 2.0 in 2020, and it has been undergoing improvements ever since. DLSS Super Resolution is essentially a frame rate boosting technology, where your GPU renders at a lower resolution, and it uses an AI model to upscale to the output resolution of your monitor. For example, your GPU might render a game at 1080p, which is fairly easy to do, and then DLSS Super Resolution works its magic and delivers a final 4K frame to your monitor, giving a crisp but much higher frame rate experience than you'd otherwise get. The visual quality has also improved massively over the years, and it can be really hard to spot the difference between a native and a DLSS image, and actually in many cases, the DLSS image can look even better than native TAA solutions, thanks to less shimmering and better detail resolve. And that raises an interesting question. What do we even mean by native anymore? Nowadays, I think native really just refers to non-upscaled, as technically a TAA image blends information from multiple frames, so it's not just a raw output. For me, that leaves DLSS as a tool not just for boosting performance, but one for fine-tuning image quality compared to traditional anti-aliasing techniques like TAA, given it can produce cleaner edges, fewer artifacts, and better fine detail, even if it's been rendered at a lower resolution than the final output. In game then, you'll find the DLSS Super Resolution option in the graphics menu, and there's a few different modes to choose from. We've got quality, balanced, performance, and ultra performance. Each mode renders at a different resolution, so obviously the less pixels are rendered, the higher the frame rates you'll get, but possibly at the cost of some visual fidelity. On the RTX 5060 Ti 16GB then, I tend to prefer the quality mode at 1440p. As you can see here in Cyberpunk for instance, it's still providing native-like image quality, but with a good 15-20fps to 20 FPS gained. DLSS performance mode is still an option too, as it really has gotten very good these days. You might notice a little more flickering in the image, but for an extra 50 FPS, it could well be worth it. Just to note that we are using the DLSS Transformer model here too, but we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Ultra performance though I think is a step too far, especially at 1080p as we can see here in Doom the Dark Ages, as this mode is really designed for 4K outputs and above, and at lower resolutions it definitely struggles. There is of course the DLSS balance mode however, which essentially splits the difference, higher frame rates than the quality mode but without reducing the render resolution as low as the performance option, so again I think that pairs very well with the 5060 Ti 16GB at 1440p. The good news is that DLSS Super Resolution also works on all RTX GPUs stretching all the way back to the 20 series from 2018. You can see it running here on the 3060 Ti and the 4060 Ti alongside the 5060 Ti 16GB in F125. All three GPUs benefit from the increased performance, but obviously the 50 series does pack in extra architectural improvements so frame rates are still highest on the Blackwell GPU. You'll also notice that the 5060 Ti 16GB offers the lowest latency too, which is one of the lesser talked about advantages of super resolution, given rendering at a higher frame rate does reduce PC latency. We will talk more about this later, but if you're trying to play a fast paced title like F125, you will want latency to be as low as possible. Figures approaching 100 milliseconds for the 3060 Ti for instance feel quite heavy and unresponsive in comparison, while the 5060 Ti 16GB provides a much better experience overall. Moving on though, we are still technically focused on super resolution here, but specifically we're going to be drilling down to the two different types of the technology. 
That's because with the launch of the 50 series, Super Resolution itself got a whole lot better thanks to the use of a new Transformer model instead of the older Convolutional Neural Network or CNN model. The Transformer model is trained on loads more data and is a more complex model, so it promises even better image quality. More and more games are being updated to support it natively, so you can manually choose between the two in the settings, or you can use NVIDIA's app to override the DLSS version by selecting the latest preset for supported titles. We can see the differences when comparing the two models side by side running on the RTX 5070. There's better sharpness and detail on moving objects, less shimmer and blur on things like foliage, plus edge sharpness and stability is loads better on the Transformer model, as you can see by looking at the wooden bridge and bricks in this scene. Cyberpunk also demonstrates better sharpness and clarity for objects in the distance, along with less shimmering and breakup behind these smoke volumetric effects too, while in Doom the Dark Ages you can see the benefit for overall detail and texture quality when in motion. In a nutshell, it's all about the visual improvements, though do be aware that as the Transformer model is a more advanced model as we said, it does reduce frame rate slightly compared to the CNN model. Not by much, we're talking about a 5% margin in this example from Spider-Man 2 on the 5070, while it's a similar margin on the 4070 as well, but interestingly, the RTX 3070 shows a bigger difference, losing over 10% performance, and that's due to the Transformer model running better on the more advanced tensor cores from the newer black hole architecture, whereas Ampere does start to show its age. Certainly based on what we've seen over the last few minutes then, it will come as no surprise that Nvidia says 80% of RTX gamers enable DLSS, while that goes up to 90% for Blackwell owners. You can also see why upscaling itself has become so pervasive, widely available now even on console, as demonstrated by the likes of PSSR on the PS5 Pro. Moving on though, it's time to talk about PC latency and Nvidia's Reflex feature. Reflex is basically designed to mitigate latency, that being the time it takes for you to register an input on the mouse or controller to that action taking place on screen. Traditionally, games have what's known as a render queue, storing frames that are prepared by the CPU in order for them to be rendered by the GPU. With Reflex, however, the render queue gets eliminated, so each frame is delivered just in time by synchronizing the CPU in time with the GPU. In game then, you'll notice a simple reflex toggle and you can get testing right away. In Cyberpunk for instance, we're looking at basically half the PC latency on the RTX 5070 and that is an insane improvement from a single setting, resulting in much more responsive gameplay. In Call of Duty Black Ops 6, you can see the difference even in the firing range with latency dropping by up to a third. I also tested out the built-in benchmark for repeatability and we can again see that while Reflex does work on older GPUs, you will still get lower latency due to the higher frame rates on newer GPUs as generally the higher the FPS, the lower the latency will be. Now that also means you might want to tinker with the settings you're using, especially for competitive titles. In Marvel Rivals, for instance, simply by dropping from the ultra preset to the low preset seems the frame rate increase massively and latency drops by 10 to 12 milliseconds, which is about a third in total. Alternatively, if you want slightly better visuals, the high preset but using DLSS performance mode to boost frame rates will achieve a similar, if not even better result, so it definitely pays to have a go adjusting those settings. Now, there's no hard and fast rules for exact latency targets, but obviously for competitive titles, the lower is better, so you're not going to feel any lag when trying to click heads. Reflex still works very well in other games though, like Horizon Forbidden West, as it's always beneficial to have lower latency, but you can get away with something that's a little bit higher in those sorts of games too. As we saw earlier as well, Cyberpunk itself inherently has slightly higher latency, but it still feels solid once Reflex is enabled. For those who want the absolute lowest latency though, Nvidia's Reflex 2 technology has been announced and this promises to reduce latency even further by updating the rendered frame based on the latest mouse input right before the image is sent to the display. It's not out just yet, but it is coming first to the Blackwell 50 series, so it's definitely something to look out for. Now though, we're moving on to talk about frame generation, a feature that first launched with the Ada Lovelace architecture, using an AI algorithm to generate a whole new frame and slotting that in between two traditionally rendered frames. Obviously, that gives a big boost to frame rate as we're adding in an extra frame that wouldn't otherwise be rendered, though frame gen does also have a knock-on effect for latency, given the GPU has to hold an extra frame ahead in order to slot in the AI-generated frame. Thankfully, Reflex is actually incorporated into the frame gen pipeline to mitigate this as much as possible, but we can still see that latency will be higher than if frame gen wasn't enabled, so that is something to keep in mind. You may also notice the difference in visual quality between a traditionally rendered frame and an AI-generated one, especially if we go ultra-slow-mo. 
However, when you're actually just playing through a game, those AI generated frames are only on screen for a few milliseconds, especially at higher frame rates, so you may not even notice. Frame gen is also not supported on the RTX 30 series, meaning the 40 and 50 series can offer a big boost in frame rates over the Ampere GPUs that simply wouldn't be possible without frame gen. However, with the launch of the Blackwell architecture, the 50 series has been able to go that step further thanks to the introduction of multi-frame generation, or MFG. Instead of adding in just one AI-generated frame, you can now add in up to three, with the 2x, 3x, or 4x modes now available from within the game settings. Not only does that drastically boost frame rates, but the latency increase is actually smaller than you might expect, with the difference between the 2x and 4x modes really not being that sizable. Given the 40 series isn't able to utilize MFG and can only do regular frame gen, you can see where the massive increases in frame rate are coming from generation on generation. MFG is also great for making really demanding games and modes more realistically playable too. This is Cyberpunk for instance running at 4K with full path tracing on the RTX 5070 Ti and we're getting roughly 100 FPS when without MFG we wouldn't even be hitting 30 frames per second. Now the latency is admittedly fairly high hitting around 80 to 90 milliseconds on the 5070 Ti and that's amplified as we're starting from a lower base frame rate. You will get a better experience using MFG when the base frame rate is higher given latency will be lower but this is part of the ongoing compromise with frame generation and the interplay between those three pillars of gaming we mentioned at the start, the frame rate may go up, but latency is also affected. In Doom the Dark Ages, MFG 4X actually enables the RTX 5070 Ti to run with path tracing enabled at a higher frame rate than what the 4070 Ti can manage without path tracing, so you're getting better graphics and a smoother frame rate. For an apples to apples comparison, if you did enable path tracing on the 4070 Ti, the frame rate drops to less than half of that of the 5070 Ti, so you can really see what sort of experiences MFG 4X can unlock. Talking of ray tracing and path tracing though, you may be wondering exactly what those two technologies are and what the difference is. Well, real-time ray tracing first really hit the PC market back in 2018 with the launch of the RTX 20 series, given those GPUs incorporated RT cores which enabled much more realistic lighting to be displayed in-game, with things like ray trace shadows and reflections. Path tracing is more recent and take things a lot further, which is why it's also been called full ray tracing. Instead of tracing rays from just a few light sources, it simulates light through an entire scene, tracing the paths of light from a much wider number of sources for even more realistic visuals. We can see the difference here in Cyberpunk running on the 5070 Ti, with more realistic reflections and shadowing when ray tracing is enabled. If we swap in the path trace mode though, things go up a level with much more realistic global illumination with less of that green hue on the floor, while the shadows and reflections get an even bigger bump to clarity and realism. There's also this scene in Doom the Dark Ages where path tracing helps the light from the glowing laser things to illuminate the scene even more, particularly around Doom Slayer's shield. Or for this next scene here, we can see the gory floor takes on a much more realistic look with the added reflections all over the wet surface, along with more natural ambient occlusion. The obvious challenge with such techniques is that they are very demanding on the GPU, especially when it comes to path tracing. Even at native 1440p, path tracing in F125 for instance will reduce frame rate below 30 FPS on the 5070 Ti and that's not really the experience anyone wants. But again, that's where NVIDIA's other technologies come in as with MFG 4X alongside super resolution quality mode, we get a much more playable experience at well over 120, sometimes even closer to 150 FPS without losing on the realistic lighting that path tracing can provide. Likewise, in Doom, if we compare ray tracing to path tracing, shows us a huge difference in performance, even when super resolution quality is enabled on both modes, but switching on MFG 4X does take frame rates significantly higher, making the experience much more enjoyable than it would otherwise be. All of those technologies can certainly come together and deliver some excellent gaming experiences then, but there is one other thing to be aware of when playing games with DLSS, MFG and path tracing, as these settings do all eat into a GPU's available video memory. That does mean certain experiences could cause issues depending on what GPU you're having and how much VRAM it has on tap. Not in every case though, as we can see for the likes of the RTX 5070 for instance with its 12 gig frame buffer, it can still do maxed out settings including path racing in Cyberpunk 2077 with DLSS set to quality mode at 1440p alongside MFG 4X. It's still very smooth at 130-140fps driving around Night City. 
Likewise, an F125, once again with image quality cranked up, path tracing enabled, and MFG 4X, we're still sitting at well over 130 FPS, with very smooth 1% loads as well, so it's certainly possible. There are some games that use more VRAM than others, however, and trying the same settings in Indiana Jones, even with medium path tracing, overwhelms the 12GB memory capacity of the 5070 and performance does drop accordingly. We can also see the same in Doom running at 4K but using the DLSS performance mode which is a 1080p render resolution but that does still cause the performance to drop due to us exceeding the VRAM limits. Now there are ways around this though, in Doom for instance I actually dropped to the high preset from Ultra Nightmare while still keeping path tracing enabled and that gave us a much more playable experience without sacrificing too much in the way of image quality and likewise for Indiana Jones, dropping down to the high preset and using DLSS balance instead of DLSS quality got us back into the 80 to 90 FPS range. So it is still possible to get a very playable experience if you're happy to tinker with the settings. That being said though, something like the RTX 5070 Ti 16 gig does get a better experience right out of the gate and you don't have to dial down the settings to get everything to fit within the video memory allocation. On top of that, you'll also notice much lower latency from the 5070 Ti given it is able to start with a much higher base frame rate. I'd say the 5070 is still playable at around 80 milliseconds PC latency in Indiana Jones given the type of game it is, but the 5070 Ti is coming in with roughly half the PC latency, so it is a much smoother feel. The difference isn't so stark if we head back to Doom the Dark Ages, however, with the 5070 adding around an extra 10 to 15 milliseconds of latency or so over the 5070 Ti, but even then, at around 80 milliseconds latency total, you could argue it's still too high for an FPS title, so if it were me, I'd be tempted to dial down the image quality further to ensure that the base frame rate is high enough that the latency isn't going to be hitting such high levels. That does bring us on to the end of this video though, and as we said at the start, there is no doubt that PC gaming has changed hugely over the last few years. The adoption of modern features means there's a lot more to the gaming experience now than just raw FPS, and it's been really interesting to see just how interlinked all of the features are that we looked at today. We've got the likes of super resolution for instance, which affects both latency, image quality, and frame rate, while frame generation can add latency but also boost frame rate in a way that wouldn't otherwise be possible. And then there's reflex which can help mitigate that latency penalty. At the end of the day, I think it all comes down to the individual and what settings you do or do not want to enable, and for me, that's the beauty of PC gaming, as there's just no right or wrong way to do it, it comes down to you and your personal preferences. Our testing today has focused on the latest and greatest features, including the likes of multi-frame generation, which is of course exclusive to the Blackwell architecture. As we saw from our testing with the 5060 Ti 16GB, the 5070 and the 5070Ti, all three GPUs are able to offer a way of playing that you simply wouldn't be able to achieve on older generations, particularly when looking at ray traced or path traced experiences in the latest AAA titles. Otherwise though, that is really the end of this video. I do just want to say if you have any questions about the technologies or the GPUs we've looked at today, please do let me know down in the comments below. While you're there, please do subscribe if you haven't already and be sure to ding that notification so you don't miss when we upload a new video. You can find our Discord server linked in the description and while you're there, you can also find links to our merch store as well as our Patreon. That's been it for this one though guys. I'm Dominic for Kick Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.